trade union, but I also like to say that I am a GMB trade union um, member as well, an activist, and also part of the uh, UK Energy Democracy Network and the Energy Forum and New Labour, um, New Lucas Plan project as well. So I think why well, sort of labelled with our trade union um, sort of official hats, obviously we are trade unionists uh, ourselves. I, I think Alice and myself, sometimes it gets kind of forgotten that we're just not officials in our unions, but also activists. Um, so we're just going to talk a bit about, I'm going to do a bit of an introduction to trade unions for energy democracy and the energy democracy discussions that are going on at the moment. And I'm just going to talk a bit more, um, not to introduce myself, about the sort of context within partly the Brexit discussions and some of the trade deals and some of the impacts on this. But um, for those who don't know, Trade Unions for Energy Democracy is actually a global initiative that was started in around 2012. Um, as a response to the failures, really, a lot of what we've just heard from the, the top table speeches about tackling climate change, both at speed and pace necessary, and the failure, really, of the international climate talk to take serious action around um, climate. So there was a bunch of trade unionists, largely um, from the US and allies in the environmental movement, that met together in 2012 in New York and came up with what they called a framing document um, called Resist, Reclaim and Restructure. Um, and that was launched in 2013 and really started what has now become a very global initiative, I think across um, something like 58 affiliates and across a number of countries, covers all parts of the globe um, and is growing amongst trade unions. We have a UK, um, what we call TUED, Group, trade Unions for Energy Democracy Group, who are part of this, which includes PCS, Unison, Unite, GMB, which might surprise some people. Um, <laughs> but, um, but to really just talk a little bit about what that means. I mean, Resist is really about resisting the fossil fuel agenda of the corporations. And they are not going to be the ones that are going to make the transition that we need in terms of the energy transition. Reclaiming is about reclaiming our energy system back to the public sphere. So we're seeing energy as a public good, as a social good. And restructuring is not just about looking at how we restructure the energy system under public ownership and democratic control. The energy democracy agenda is also very much about social justice. Because what's really central to it is, again, a lot of things that we've just heard off the um, top table this morning. The energy system needs to be changed also to ensure that we deal with issues of fuel poverty and energy poverty across the globe and that this energy transition is a fair transition for workers and communities and also people as consumers of energy as well. So the main <coughs> thing obviously which we're now pursuing from the UK context is the public ownership of energy, bringing that back not into an old centralised, uh, bureaucratised Whitehall model of nationalisation, which the right would like to have us or have people believe when the Labour Party talk about that, but actually is genuine public ownership and thinking about what does that mean? What does it mean across the whole of our energy system? And when we talk about the energy system, we mean both the generation, the transmission, the distribution, and the supply side. So all parts of it. And Transport is also part of the energy system, so that also comes into that as well. But mainly that's what we're talking about um, when we, we try to sort of develop also the kind of um, literacy of the energy system, because I think quite often people don't understand how it breaks down across the system. And we are um, fairly unique in the UK. We have um, throughout the world and that the privatised energy system right, right across all spheres of it. And as many of you will know, the National Grid was privatised last year, um, is now in the hands of Macquarie's, which is obviously one of the awful um, private companies that was running Thames Water, I think it was, and made a, a right mess of that, and those people who suffered without water um, last, um, last week, um, that's obviously one of the consequences of those privatisation. But the other really key point to this is about privatisation. Because the energy democracy agenda is saying we are not going to make the transitions needed um, to tackle climate change, to transition to renewable energy and all these other things that we need to do unless we take it out of the private sector. There are no market-based solutions that are going to enable this to happen. So this is really why we need to bring it back. We need to bring energy back as a common good and within the public sphere. But as I said earlier, we don't just want it as some kind of 
um, bureaucratised um, system as well. It's about how do people engage with their energy system? What kind of institutions do we need to start looking at? How do people participate in the energy they need? How do we make these energy choices? Fracking, as we know, has been foisted upon this country and the community in Lancashire. They said no to fracking in Lancashire, and yet that's being taken over by central government's and national infrastructure priority. It's been really heartening to see that the Labour Party are now adopting this agenda. We've still got some way to go in, in making decisions around um, the overall energy system. Um, but that's been a real boost. And as Sarah said from the, the platform earlier, it was really historic at the TUC last um, September that the whole trade union movement got behind the energy democracy agenda. We still need to have a lot of discussions about that and what it means, because obviously, um, as it is the GMB that comes up, there are a lot of members in the fossil fuel industries, a lot of trade unions are nervous about what is going to happen <coughs> to their members and those workers. And quite rightly so, and we need to have proper <coughs> solutions to that, about that. But that's why energy democracy is also about the whole just transition message and about social, environmental and economic justice for everybody. So really what we're trying to do is how do we build this across the trade unions? There are some of us that meet in discussing this, but we need to get this out um, with wider support, um, wider support obviously across the public. The, the public overwhelmingly supports um, it's called shorthand nationalisation of the energy system. It's around 70% um, support. It's very, very high um, and across the utilities, as um, most of you, I'm, I'm sure, will know. But that, that's really our challenge about how we actually build this as a proper agenda within the trade union movement and obviously linking up to communities and others who are involved in energy um, energy justice issues, energy transition issues and achieving a zero carbon economy and we do absolutely talk about a zero carbon economy. So I think I'll just end it there and hand over to Alison um, to either add. Um, yes, uh, thank you um, Sam. Um, yes, I'm Alison Roach from Unison. Um, I'm a policy officer in Unison. Um, I did have the responsibility for climate change, environment and privatisation but at the moment I'm um, mainly working on Brexit. So I'd just say to Sam, what I was going to do is kind of put what trade, um, trade union energy democracy is trying to do in a kind of Brexit context, <coughs> because um, I was actually with Barry on Thursday up at um, the TUC Midlands. We were doing an industrial strategy meeting for the TUC up there. And it was predominantly um, Unite that were there, actually, which I thought was quite a shame, because actually Brexit is going to affect every industrial um, sector and public se services unless we get the right deal. Um, and actually, <coughs> I'm covering all of the Brexit angles, and I do work with Sustain, I do work with Friends of the Earth. The climate change or energy discussions, to me, have been very low on the agenda. They've hardly um, peaked at the top of anybody's agenda. And largely, uh, one, I think it's because Brexit is very complicated, and two, people really don't understand what options or where we are and how the law is going to be fundamentally changed. So um, I was just going to start by saying that 80% of our environmental uh, energy um, legislation is directors from Europe. And what the government's trying to do at the moment through the EU withdrawal bill is actually take control of that. Um, they say they're going to take it, retain it, and call it EU retained law in the UK statutes. But they will also be giving ministers at the same time powers to modify it how they seem as necessary. That's very worrying. It's a power grab by the executive <coughs> against Parliament. We're trying to stop from doing that. Um, the second thing they're trying to do, though, is that they've got two other bills. These bills are all enabling bills because if there's no deal March 2019, then they don't care because they've got the power. So they're putting three bills in, and the fourth one will be the migration bill, which we'll probably get um, in autumn. But all these bills have one thing in common, and the trade bill in particular wants to either flip over um, all the trade bills that we have as a third country when we leave um, Europe in March. There's about 70 of the key um, trade deals we'll have to take over from the European Union. But again, they don't want to really look at what these trade deals are, and um, they've got no idea that these countries might want to renegotiate these trade deals. And again, they want ministers to do all the power, and Parliament doesn't have the same. 
So we are working with Barry and the um, business <coughs> trade movement on democratising free trade deals. Now, you might think, what's that got to do with energy? The reason why that's got to do a lot of energy environmental standards is because trade deals are no longer about um, your quotas or your tariffs. We've got a customs union for that, which we may or may not leave, which I'll talk about a bit later. Free trade deals um, now are all about regulating standards. But at the moment, they're all about pushing standards down, not about making them higher. And Europe's got the highest standards, whether they're, they're workers' rights um, and all their environmental standards, all they are to do with um, passporting and regulating finance. There are standards, health and safety, equality, we've got a charter of fundamental rights. They will go if we do a free trade deal. Now, what we don't want is a free trade deal to replace what we have with the rest of the world uh, if we have a Tory government, because they'll be trading someone like um, Trump who might think, great, now the UK is not back in Europe, I'll bring back TISA. TISA is the worst trade deal in the world ever written for all, everybody's rights, everybody's environmental rights. And in those um, trade deals, what they have, we've had CETA, we've got Japanese, we've got Singapore, we've got loads of different trade deals. But they don't just do quotas, they also do like swap seeds. It really is like children in the playground swapsing the sweets. Because basically what they say is, well, you, you're, you've got more of that, and therefore, mm, we'll, OK, we'll allow you to give us some of that, but we've got more of this and we'll allow you to have some of that. Let's just haggle on the price. Let's haggle on how much we're going to do. It really is just fundamentally about that. And energy in the UK, we are at the moment not self-sufficient. Now, we've got a UK domestic project uh, for trade and democracy along with um, CAC2, etc., and all the other alliances. Obviously... Unison, my trade union, we want to reach 100% renewable. Um, so we've got a, a domestic agenda, but we also have got to have an international and a European agenda because we can't simply do this on our own, largely because uh, we're not self-sufficient. And in the just transition, we have to have some pathway where we are going to negotiate around the world and with Europe when we leave about what energy we'd like from them. Uh, also, we want to be part of research or grants uh, to, to enable us to transition. Now, what I want to say is that the sort of models that we get from Europe will actually impact on that just transition. It's happening now. Basically, the government is arguing um, with Europe on what type of framework we'll have in the future. That all has to be done and dusted and signed by autumn. Again, with very little say from Parliament, and even then it's just laid as a new treaty. So we don't even get... Parliament can't amend it, they can't um, discuss it unless it goes to a scrutiny committee. We're going to end up with a new international treaty of Europe with no say about how we wanted energy put in it. So it's up to us in this room to actually raise this with people like Barry, raise it to Alan Whitehead. Uh, I know um, Mika here is doing a lot of the Labour Energy Forum... Um, that's quite important, but it's a lot more complicated than that because on top of that we have a Corbyn agenda which wants to nationalise uh, industries and um, energy would be one of them. And so there seems to be tension in the Labour Party around what type of model we'd argue for where we can nationalise but also get um, the tools that we need to um, implement a just transition but also regulate around the world with the highest regulations that we want. Now, all the research shows that we're not going to get any better than what we've got in Europe, simply because most people have got lower standards or there isn't actually much room for us to benefit from international trade. So I think it's really important that we do partly today discuss what we want from um, a Brexit um, deal or EU-UK agreement. Now, one thing, for example, just to give you an example, is... If we leave as a free trade, which is what is on the table at the moment, it means the national grid will have to pay to access um, all the interconnectors in Europe, because we will no longer be part of it. How much does that cost? How much will consumers have to bear that cost? What, what will that mean? I don't, think, I don't know if anybody's calculated those costs. I certainly haven't. Um, also, in the future... Um, we, in EPSU, EPSU is the European Public Service Unions, which is all the public services in Europe um, who belong to this. It's like our ETUC or TUC, if you like. 
we are doing a research paper on um, the energy internal market. Do we stay in that market if we Brexit? If we, according to the EPSI research, they're beginning to hint that we should stay in it. I've got a meeting with them next week, but that's what they're saying, because it'd be too costly for consumers in the short term unless we have a backstop against how we're going to fill that gap. So the internal energy market, though, is dreadful, and it's completely contradictory to us wanting to nationalise our utilities, because in that market, it's backed up by directives which say that it has to be liberalised, this market. So these are real important questions. How do we get the best of being in a market which may benefit us in the short term or long term as part of transition, but also consumers? Nobody can afford our um, gas and electricity bills rising. Government promised a cap. They haven't done it. Um, we know that the big six or big five now will want a shake-up. But we have to have a kind of roadmap, and I'm just saying that Brexit has got to be included in this consideration. Um, tariffs. Labour has said we'll have a customs union. Well, a customs union is just about quotas and um, around our island so that when goods come, we, though we've already paid the tariff and then we can freely um, trade um, without tariffs. But it doesn't end customs union checks, actually. There has to be paperwork. There has to be a lot of business administration. And the EU keep on telling us, without being in the single market, a customs union is just a lorry. It doesn't carry... Um, any of your rights or regulations or standards on it, we have to negotiate that in a separate deal. So our energy and our environmental um, regulations that we want, we will have to put in any deal. And we have to make sure the government puts it. Now I'm going to tell you something, what Francis O'Grady has been doing. Because Francis O'Grady has been meeting Barnier um, for the last year, constantly saying... I don't want, look, if this government's going to go for a really hard Brexit and a free trade deal, I don't want a rubbish free trade deal where there are just going to be no rights for workers, no standards, nothing, because they will deregulate. The, the, the Telegraph reported last week that, I can't remember which MP it is, um, some Tory MP has already set up a campaign to end red tape as soon as we leave. They will go for that route, we know that. Mm. Barnier has done a great favour, I think, for us. If you read um, what was published, the draft guidelines, in paragraph 9, he has said you can have your free trade deal, but you have to have um, regulations which will align with us, and he's included social, environmental regulations. And that is so important, because if we don't have that, then we'll end up with a free trade deal which will lower all our standards. And I don't know how we'll get trade energy democracy where we'll have a government committed to privatising um, all our electricity for any price it wants to. It doesn't care if the national grid's going to have to pay to access some interconnectors because they're just going to bung it onto consumers like they always do. It really is against our interest to allow this government to get away with a free trade deal because it will be disastrous for us and for our project for energy democracy. So that's just a few thoughts there. And... Um, the trade union movement, the TUC, the ETUC, are telling us it will be a disaster. Now, Unison doesn't have a position on Brexit, and I'm trying to be Brexit neutral here because I don't want to go into that whole Brexit debate. As a trade union, some people who want the best for workers, we just need to know this is happening, and it's happening quicker, and we're going to be waking up um, in almost a year to where we could be in a situation where we've, got, we've lost all our rights. And one last thing. When we get this free trade deal, what we lose, more importantly, is a trade union um, and organisations who represent all sorts of people. We lose our right as individuals to actually appeal to the European Union because these free trade deals have no courts. They have private investor courts, which allows big companies to sue governments because they've lost out on some investment because perhaps something got nationalised or we whipped off a contract from Virgin doing healthcare or something like that. But individually, we have no right to appeal. At the moment, we do. So we also have to say any free trade deal, any customs, has to allow some more democratic court where we can argue about our environmental rights. We've got pollution, the highest in London. Where are we going to take that campaign to in Europe? Um, so this is what I'm trying to say. We need to wake up about how we frame our arguments at the moment. 
if we really want to hang on to some of the best and highest regulations we've got in environmental standards. Right, we're going to open to the floor now, but just a couple of things that when Alison was speaking reminded me I, I forgot to mention, um, and I think very important in the context of that. I mean, one thing about the whole privatisation argument, um, Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, who produced some really good research papers, I mean, they, they are quite sort of tomes of documents, but if you go to their websites, they are fantastic to read. Um, but we can give you the details the website at the end. But one very important paper which they produced very recently is it's called Preparing a Public Pathway Confronting the Investment Crisis in Renewable Energy. And this is the back of, of another paper they produced last year. It's really about the myths of how close we are getting to renewable energy globally, um, not just in the UK, but in the UK. The numbers are quite small. And really, um, as we again heard around some of the, the, the COP talks about the, the level of finances that have to be leveraged in to actually make this energy transition. That is not happening. That's actually going backwards. Um, so all the future forecasts about where we need to be by 2050 is not going to happen under this privatised model. And this is a really good evidential piece of literature um, <coughs> around that. And I think just the other thing I want to mention as, as well, because... Obviously, talking about the impacts of climate change, um, when Hurricane Irma and Maria struck across um, the Caribbean and several of the states there, Puerto Rico was totally ravished. Puerto Rico has a private energy company at the moment, and unbelievably, um, now the, the island's in desperate straits. They are desperately trying to privatise their energy system. Um, so it, it, it's kind of quite ironic where we're actually using the arguments here of climate change, saying we need it back under public ownership. That's actually being used as an opportunity in Puerto Rico to go in and privatise their energy system. And that there's still many people in Puerto Rico that actually have no energy at the moment. So I think we'll leave it there and obviously open the floor to any questions, discussion points, um, what people want to say. So, gen <laughs> gentlemen there, so I don't know your name, sorry, and then. <coughs> so, um, I'd just like to uh, reiterate somewhat of the question I said in the larger room earlier, which is um, how clean is renewable energy? Um, if anyone knows anything about circular economy, cradle to cradle, Helen Carter, if you've got a 24-hour clock, the way we're calculating clean energy is we're just going to 6 o'clock in the morning. We're not going all the way back to zero. Go back to the soil, go back to the mining lands in Africa, in India, the reason we are getting such cheap, we will keep on getting cheap lithium, is because one of the biggest sources of lithium alongside Congolese, some countries in Africa, is Afghanistan. And how do we get it from Afghanistan? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? How do we end up? The, the whole predication of renewable energy, which is affordable, is based on, and has always been based on, like it's been based on for the last few hundred years, is we're British, we need those resources, we're not going to pay fair price, let's just be, beat the crap out of the civilians, invade their country, take it back, and then just say we've liberated them. We haven't liberated anyone, we've unliberated them. I can tell you that there is slave labour of little girls, there's rape of the women, there's murder of the men in those communities, just like you see in South America, for the oil. When I looked at the flooding that happened in Brazil a few years ago, I thought, which is the company responsible for this? It was BHP Billiton. So I saw, which are the other mining sites they have in South America, because they can't control a lot of land. Their mining sites improved, but it was not for mining oil. It was for mining lithium. So when you <coughs> mine lithium out of the land, out of the soil, what happened in Brazil? Huge floods. Same thing happened in Peru. My question here is, everyone's talking clean renewable energy, as if it's as white as this wall over here, it's dirtier than we think. It's hugely dirty. And it's disgusting for me that we are still pushing out this notion that it's clean energy. If there were people of colour from the South, they'd tell you the truth, that for the last 10 years, the reason why you can get lithium is because... President of the United States, Obama, bombed seven countries for the last 10 years. So my question is, that how clean is it? Are people looking at the full life cycle of it? And are we giving another 
business to the oil industry. The oil industry are the only ones capable of doing this. So let's move on to somebody else because we have more yeah. questions in. Thank you. Um, so I'm next. Simon I, and then okay. yourself. Yeah, okay, so sure. Simon. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thanks, uh, Simon Pirani. I'm an energy researcher. Um, I, I, looking forward, so we're here to talk about trade unions and climate change. Looking forward a couple of years, we're hoping, I think everybody in this room is hoping, there's going to be a Labour government led by Jeremy Corbyn. What I see, and thinking back to the first session, is that there are two sets of pr uh, problems, and I would like, my question would be, should we not uh, distinguish these uh, two sets of problems and find a way of working uh, through forums like this one on both of them? first set of problems is a load of immediate stuff. You know, the Labour government's going to come in, the city's going to be onto John McDonnell, uh, you know, like a, I don't know what the expression is, um, <laughs> a ton of bricks, uh, you know, trying to constrain whatever he's going to do. Uh, the, uh, the, the, hopefully, Labour supporters, the trade unions and so on, are going to up the ante, um, and there goes, there's going to be immediate questions in play. A lot of the stuff that Alison has her head around, and I certainly don't, about Brexit, uh, all that stuff. Uh, what about the big six? What about Hinckley? You know, immediate decisions are just going to be coming through the door, one after the other, right? What about air pollution and so on and so on? People are going to have to deal with them. But then there's a second set of problems, and I, what I think is, I, I think it's really important to acknowledge that this is a second, they're connected, of course, but there's the problems of Paris, right? of imperialism, which uh, the, the, uh, uh, our friend here has just spoken about, about uh, the international relationships. Who's going to be uh, looking at those? Possibly uh, Barry, who spoke in the first session. He made it very clear that he thinks, so going back to that first, he made it very clear that he thinks that Paris is basically on the right track. Uh, I, I don't. I shared a view that was put by Asad Raymond, uh, that the, the Paris, Paris uh, uh, scenarios miss all the targets by a million miles, that there's a real problem with negative emissions and so on. Now, I mean, those are big, complicated problems. What I think is that as uh, a, a working class movement, as social movement, uh, as ecological movements, we need to be working on both at the same time. Because the danger is the Labour government will come in, uh, all that immediate stuff will come through the front door uh, Corbyn and company, who are in a minority in the Parliamentary Labour Party, don't want to depress you, but I mean, <laughs> that's the fact, right? The Parliamentary Labour Party is a right-wing body, um, may even be in a minority uh, government, uh, having to cut, uh, make all sorts of coalition deals and so on. It's all going to get very complicated, very messy. So at the same time, if there's not a forward-looking uh, group, section, uh, you know, contingent, who are looking at Paris and these much bigger questions and the question of a big social transformation, which is what an energy transformation has to be, I, I think we get lost. Okay. Thanks, Yeah, sure. Hi, my name is Obi. I'm from the uh, Occupy London and actually Green Party as well. I did actually notice the one about the um, hustings back in 2014. I wasn't a member then, but then no one actually, ha hardly any mention of the environment apart from the Greens. But the last hustings I was in, I'm standing in the local elections, Everybody mentioned, you know, environment. There, they had to prove their uh, green creden credentials, which made me happy. I'm thinking, yes, hopefully it's not the uh, hug the husky moment again from Cameron. Uh, so it's like, uh, so I, I can see that actually people, uh, tourists as well, are concerned about the uh, their environment, air pollution, and that hopefully their uh, children will actually grow up without um, lungs being shrunk. Uh, but anyway, I'm also from the Philippines, and I was actually going to say that yes. Uh, Unfortunately, the city of London is actually filled with uh, extractivist uh, companies like Extrata. They were in the Philippines. They actually killed off a lot of uh, tribes people. And then I read that the um, CEO recently bought a nice 100 million pound flat in Knightsbridge. I'm thinking to myself, whoa. So like, uh, it's, it is affecting uh, this country. Uh, but then we actually have the benefits that actually we are uh, mostly protected. We're not actually about to get murdered. But in other countries... Uh, they just go in there, they ignore everything. Usually it's a corrupt government anyway that accepts uh, bribes, and they, they can do whatever they want. Uh, the, the problem we do have is really we have um, um, like an, uh, an obsolescent uh, design for, a for an economy. So like I have a five-year-old phone, but then a lot of people change their phones every year. 
So in some cases, yeah, we need to actually have our phones renewed, like uh, just refurbished, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> some of those things, we need to actually develop them. Uh, but it's like instead of actually in my line of work as a builder, I hate it that we have to throw away these like five-year-old ovens and, and microwaves. They're also working, but of course, because it's a new, it's a new project, the, the people there who are who are you know have yeah have more money they actually want new new things, and I, the the best thing I can do is actually shout out on Facebook and say who needs this it is available please do you want this uh, five year old washing machines dryers dishwashers and uh, please because the the worst thing that I can do which I really hate even the guys who the waste management guys that actually take these things from us hate the fact that we have to throw them away uh, we just shake our heads and these are still working. But unfortunately, uh, in this country as well, we don't actually we don't we don't we don't do uh, refurbishing. We actually just throw them away, forget it, put it in a landfill, maybe take some some of the metal away, and that's it. Uh, I suppose it's yeah something we need to actually uh, work on. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, what's next? Yeah. yeah. Well, a couple of things. First, obviously, the Tory agenda for Brexit is, is very obvious. Um, a number of their MPs wrote to think for the Telegraph. Don't have to worry about economic development because we'll be able to open free ports and enterprise zones. Mm -hmm. right. And you just think about the implications of what that, that will mean. Um, I think it's um, the, the key question, I think, for us as a movement is, isn't so much, if you like, waiting for, for a Labour government as, as, as so much as preparing for one. And insofar as we've got the, uh, the TUC on the Baker's Union resolution about energy democracy. And insofar as the Labour Party manifesto included a whole load of very, very positive headlines um, all around this issue and around, and you've got people like Barry saying this is the framework within which the government investment strategy and all the rest of it will be carried out. That, it seems to me, is the most promising agenda ever had in this movement on this issue. But we've got to do the work to actually prepare the ground to make it a reality. It's one thing having a headline in your manifesto saying, right, we're going to retrofit four million homes. You actually got to have the people who are going to do it. You got to have the people who who can train the people who are going to do it. And you've got to people who are going to train the people who are going to train the people who are going to do it. Yeah? So all of that needs a lot of very, very detailed work well sector by sector. So there's a huge amount of work to be done there. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say is, I don't know if anybody apart from me has noticed that quadrilla rhymes with Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> sure we have. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. I think it's, it's, it's John. So, yeah. 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 Me? Yeah. Did you want to speak? Yes. Yeah. I just think a pessimistic tinge around and I just think we need to get into a very more positive mood because clearly there's a lot of support for renewable. There's lots of anger about austerity. There's loads of ways we can raise the money. Whether it's from a land tax, tax on the rich, stopping the tax havens, and so on. And if you start on a million climate jobs scenarios, of having a million climate jobs and start building good homes, good jobs, etc., we can get mass support. And I think, you know, the Parliamentary Labour Party has never been a progressive force. But let's not fixate on that. Let's fixate on getting the rank and file trade unions organised more. GMB nationally is always concerned about their members losing jobs to fracking and combat gas industries. As far as I've been told, a lot of the rank and file not and the Unite are not really in favour of Hinckley, not in favour of Trident, for example, and we should just really crack on with getting the rank file members 
campaigning for these brilliant climate jobs. Okay, right. So I've got one here in the red top, and then Dave, you afterwards. Um, very brief. Um, just thinking back about life cycle analysis, um, and I agree, none of the sources of energy that we use at the moment are clean. Um, there's different degrees of the impact we have on climate, on earth, water, and human rights. The reason none of them are clean is because at the moment it's all under capitalism, so capitalism is prioritising profits Profit. rather than environmental protection, rather than workers' rights, rather than human rights in different countries. Mm. I think that's the first time I've heard the word capitalism said today, and I need to bring it back mm. into the discussion rather than just talking about the Yeah, I'm also on this point about you know the, the, the environmental and, and human uh, uh, impacts of some of the renewable technologies. The gentleman mentioned uh, lithium. Uh, probably the flagship for the green movement for a long time has been solar panels. Um, but actually, uh, you know, and everybody sh they're, all, they're all shouting now about how wonderful it is the cost of solar panels is, is going down, and that means we can do lots of renewable energy and ways to be wonderful. Uh, solar panel production is actually uh, based on the use of some very toxic and, and nasty chemicals that cause major uh, environmental and worker health problems in China. And you know, I don't think it's a, an accident. The reason that China is the you know the space where that happens is because, of course, uh, you know, where labour standards there are you know are much worse, and it's much harder to uh, to protest about them. Um, so I think I think the green movement actually has to take a serious look at, at solar panels themselves. Um, uh, the real question I wanted to ask you though was uh, the one that you raised actually in your talk, which is what does a, uh, gen a real energy democracy look like that is not just about uh, you know nationalisation um, and you know bureaucratic control from from Westminster? I think that um, I, I get the feeling that there's some very interesting. Uh, initiatives going on in communities around the country and including some uh, local governments uh, initiatives uh, and, and real bottom-up people in uh, led initiatives uh, on, on local energy production but yeah I guess my question is how does the, the trade union and the labor movement link link in with that in a way that yeah really produces uh, a de democratically controlled energy system okay thanks Dave so I've got a gentleman here, and then you're next. Yeah, I, um, I'm Phil Johnson from University of Sussex, and a UCU member, so I've only gone in my 40th stroke. Yeah. But um, I just wanted to really comment on what I think is the elephant in the room in the case of the UK, that we kind of speak in a language as if the momentum is that we're heading towards a very large amount of renewables and the policy momentum is around that. Actually... The elephant in the room is that the UK, unlike any other country in Europe or indeed the developed world, mm. has is obsessed <laughs> with the commitment to huge amounts of new nuclear power stations. Mm. And a huge part of the trade union movement is in favour of that. Mm. Um, and when it comes to the question of the financing, I think it's absolutely right that uh, the the amount of money that you need to really accelerate the renewables transition is a lot. And if you're going to be prioritizing uh, financing uh, reactors built by Chinese or Koreans or French or whatever, and these mad small modular reactors that just so happen to be built by the submarine reactor manufacturer Rolls-Royce, again heavily unionized, um, you don't have enough money for everything. So it seems to be a real blockage or tension in the uh, you know, for the trade unions, that the, is a difficulty, and um, it's simply not discussed because often because it's uncomfortable. But I think it needs to be discussed, and the rationales for why the UK is doing that and no other country. I don't think it's about energy policy. I think it's about something else, which is about sustaining skills and capabilities related to the UK's uh, nuclear base, so it can remain at the top table. Because without a large civilian program, it can't maintain the skills required for the Trident. Exactly. Very uncomfortable issue, but that's what our research at Sussex has revealed. So, just throwing that out there. Thank you. Gentlemen, there. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Ingar, from the uh, LSE. <coughs> I'd like to thank Alison for that devastating analysis of the impact of some of these issues. Uh, the 
other, and it took really, I, I don't know how to deal with some of those questions you raised. I worked partly in the same way. Because two weeks ago, I was really inspired by hearing uh, John Bell and Corbyn talking in London. To, and, and it was a, a tremendous uh, argument to draw for public ownership as a way of securing a just transition. Mm -hmm. um, my, my question is, uh, and there was lots of that today, it's not top down, you mentioned municipalities and cooperatives. Um, I, uh, and there are four areas that we've seen in doubt, uh, rail, and rail, uh, energy, and water. So if just look at energy, and rail and rail are very easy to pair with energy and water, because we're talking huge sums to bring these, uh, these industries back into, into public ownership. Uh, and uh, apart from issuing bonds, and I don't know how that ties in to municipalities and courts, I, I, I don't understand, I don't see a mechanism. <laughs> Land value um, tax. What, what so, um, well, um, I'm a former and I'm actually a Labour councillor in Harlow. I'm a nurse and I work in the hospital. I'm a UNICEF rep. I think it's very important. This is a very important topic. And that, the reason I came here today was I found it by accident, by the way. And I thought, no, I'm going to come and find out all about it because, to tell you the truth, I'm pretty ignorant on this. I know quite a lot of different subjects, but when it comes to this, I'm pretty ignorant because it's not, it's not well published out there and it's difficult. So my point is, I bring motions all the time in all the meetings I go to, whether it's all members, union meetings, anything. This is the kind of thing we need to take to our people out there and discuss and see how we can, what kind of policy do we want the Labour government to have and this is very, very important. And I'm actually putting one, I'm sending one tomorrow for the following Monday. So at least the group, we can discuss it and decide what do we really want. Because if we don't do anything about this, I don't have children, so I suppose it doesn't matter for me. If you know what I mean, people say, well, are you worried? But I do worry because there are children out there, the future, and your grandchildren, great-grandchildren, or whatever. It's very important to actually get this right so that we have a future, where the children have a future. So that's, that's the importance. So please, you know, it's nice to sit here. I, I've learned a lot, so it's good to come here. But we need to spread it out there, because there's a lot of people out there who don't know about it and don't, don't know the, the consequences. So um, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Um, I've got four more speakers on the list. I'm going to take those and see where we're at. So Duncan, what's next? Um, thanks for mentioning co-ops. That's one of the things that doesn't always get mentioned in big trade union labour movement gatherings, and I think it's a big solution. The other thing is that the energy hierarchy has got to start, like the waste hierarchy, with reduce, and, and bless the, the bakers for mentioning retrofit. But it's the most difficult thing. It's what the, all the energy ministers quack about. The, the cheapest energy is the energy you don't need to use, and then they do squat about it, because it's really granular and local and difficult. We have to, talking about the plan, we have to have a plan. And I'm making an appeal here because I'm involved in Brixton in trying to do this and raise some funds to do uh, pioneer business models for doing. Everybody I know who's been involved in retrofit and insulation has gone out of business, stopped doing it because they can't make a living. There's no central funding. So anybody who has any best practice experience or any projects that are working around the country, please come and talk to me. Because we need to do that, and that is something that can work at the cooperative level. Because it's essentially local; it can involve um, it can involve sole traders, and and it doesn't have to be done by a big corporation. And also localized energy. Um, there is a great organisation called Retrofit Works, which is a co-op, which is among the few who are making it work. Um, but we need more. <laughs> Please come and <coughs> download. Gentlemen, there. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think we need to come back about what trade unions. Um, I mean, we're talking a lot about what Labour is going to do and uh, all the rest of it. But actually, fundamentally, I mean, the real, what the importance about the trade union movement is not that we just have lots of people, which we do, but the fact that actually we are the people who actually produce things. We are the people that produce goods, we're the people that produce services, and without us, there is nothing. And we have, therefore, an enormous potential power. The most one of the most important things that we've been arguing 
about that. Who doesn't believe in private jobs? Is, it, is trade unions are the social force that actually can make the kind of transition happen? Because when we are organised collectively, we can do these things. And I think that's the thing that we need to, to concentrate on, to concentrate on, on our organisation and arguing quite rightly that uh, climate change is absolutely integral to everything about bringing social justice and, and equality. And that's absolutely central, I, I think, to do. I mean, if the Tory, if Brexit goes through, the Tories do all the things that, that, that are being threatened, we're not going to sit back and let them happen. I certainly hope not. You know, it means we're going to actually have to get people active, we're going to organise and, and take industrial action. And that's, you know, we're going to have to fight. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the important thing. That's the absolutely key thing. So without that, we're, we're, we're completely sunk. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, um, you, you can't have energy democracy without workplace democracy. Now, a couple of people have kind of touched on that already, but we're, we're, not, we're not going to achieve anything unless the people, you know, the, the workers themselves are in control of, of, of their own lives. That's got to be absolutely central to a just transition. You know, if we, if we think that that's a, a sideline issue, we're, we're, we're sunk. The EU at least had some subsidiarity bit built into it in that regard. It was an attempt to have democracy uh, down at the lowest level where, where, where possible. The UK is extremely bad at that, mm. extremely bad. Westminster is a perfect example of it. Mm -hmm. Trade unions uh, traditionally have been top-down, bureaucratic, and, and have not been, been able to, 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 to fulfil that, now, uh, to, to be democratic. Now, in, in, in Scotland, we've got some slightly th different things going on. That's, Scotland's the second board that I haven't heard mentioned today. <laughs> we, we, we are kind of ahead of the game on this. I think we should be talking more about what we can do together. Right? I deliberately joined the SNP in, in, uh, in Scotland to, to organise the trade unionists within that party. Why? Because the Labour Party is a busted flush in Scotland. Like it or not, I'm sorry, it's the truth. Now, it may come back. Great if it comes back. I'll support 